and open your Bible to Joshua, the book of Joshua. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 1 this morning. And it's only a, a slight coincidence that I chose to preach on a book of the Bible that I share a name with. When I was little, I was excited that my name was in the Bible. I was excited that my name was Joshua. I used to have the, the whole plastic armor of God get up that you would get at Jesus Chapel. You guys, I'm getting a lot of laughing and nods. You know what I'm talking about. And I would pretend like I was Joshua and I'd march and, and, um, and want the, the walls of Jericho to come tumbling down. I had these cardboard blocks that I'd build up and, you know, I'd kind of march around and then I'd just kind of kick it with my leg and pretend like it was God knocking it down. And I always looked up to Joshua. Little did I know that at the time that they were entering the promised land, the time that we're going to be looking at this morning, Joshua was 80 years old. I had no idea. I had no idea that I was pretending to be a, an old man. I should have had a cane with me as I was walking around, but I, I did not. This morning, we're going to look at an extremely significant passage of Scripture. This is uh, a really crucial time for the people of God. It's a crucial time for Israel. It really represents a monumental time in history. Around 2100 BC, God made a promise to Abraham. And it was a couple hundred years later that Joseph and his whole family found themselves in Egypt. And it was roughly 400 years after that when Moses appears on the scene and leads the people of God out of Egypt in the Exodus. And now it's 40 years roughly after that. It's approximately 1405 B.C. And Joshua is standing at the bank of the Jordan. Moses has just died. And Israel is about to enter into the land that was promised to them around 700 years previous. Can you imagine what Joshua must have been feeling at this moment? Can you imagine what he must have been feeling? The anticipation of a land for the people of God, the excitement that what God had promised was about to take place. 40 years previously, Joshua, along with 11 other spies, went into the land. They came back. Joshua and Caleb, they wanted to enter into that land, but the other 10 were afraid. And that fear spread throughout all of Israel. They didn't go in, and they wandered for 40 years. And now Moses has died. Joshua is being called by God to be Moses' successor. Think about that for a moment. Moses has led the people of God out of Israel, and you have that act to follow. That would be intimidating. Trying to be the successor of Moses. Remember, Numbers 12, 3 says, The man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Welcome to leadership, Joshua. Welcome to leadership. No pressure. But God is not leaving Joshua to himself. God did not leave Moses to himself when he led the people of God out of Egypt, and God is not going to leave Joshua to himself as he leads the people of God into the promised land. Joshua is standing on the bank of the Jordan River, and God is going to commission him to enter into that promised land. And we this morning really have the privilege of getting to be a fly on the wall in the conversation that God has with Joshua. We get to eavesdrop on God's conversation with Joshua, and what God is going to communicate to Joshua in this passage is exactly what Joshua needed to hear at this moment. And what is in this passage has been exactly what I needed to hear this last week and what we get to see in this passage this morning, I believe, is exactly what we must see about the character of our great God. So, would you read with me Joshua 1, verses 1 through 9. Now it came about, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... That the Lord, Yahweh, spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. 
Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun, will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to the, all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not tremble or be dismayed, for Yahweh, your God, is with you wherever you go. What a commission. Let's pray. <clears throat> Excuse me. God, your character exudes from this text. Your faithfulness, your mercy, your provision, your kindness flows from your words to Joshua in this moment. Lord, help us see what we must about you this morning. As you were near to Joshua at this time, Lord, be near to us now. Give us eyes to see your holiness. Give us hearts that are molded into your likeness as we draw near to you now in your word. No man is worthy to communicate what you have communicated to us in your word. But Lord, I pray that you would use me now to make yourself known. Encourage hearts where they are faint. Strengthen lives where they are weak. Lord, we pray all of this for the glory of your name, for the name of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. God's commission of Joshua is grounded on six distinctives. This morning, we're going to see six distinctives that God's commission of Joshua is grounded on. God's commission of Joshua is grounded on six distinctives. In Joshua 1, 1 through 9, we're going to see six distinctives that God's commission of Joshua is grounded on. God is commissioning Joshua to enter into the promised land, to lead God's people into the land that he promised to his fathers. And we're going to see six distinctives that are really the foundation of this commission that God is giving to Joshua. So first, would you look with me, the first distinctive of God's commission of Joshua that we see here is God's plan. Number one, God's plan. Not one detail of what, he, what is taking place here has caught God off guard. Look at verses one and two with me. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. The people of Israel wandered for 40 years, part of God's plan. The previous generation has died, part of God's plan. Moses has died, part of God's plan. Joshua is going to be the new leader over Israel. That is part of God's plan. The people of God are about to cross the Jordan and enter into the land which God promised. That is part of God's plan. 
And not only has all of this been part of God's plan, he has been actively working, preparing Joshua for this moment. Moses has not died, and now God is left wondering, what shall I do? Whom shall I send? No. God has been preparing, actively working in the life of Joshua. He's been given an extraordinary task. Joshua has been given an extraordinary task. Entering into the land, leading the people of God. But God has already used Joshua in the past to accomplish extraordinary things. In Exodus 17, when Amalek came and fought against Israel, Moses sent Joshua to lead the army into battle while he and Aaron went up the hill. And God told Moses that if he held the staff up high, you remember this, right? If he held the staff up high, God would give them victory. And if the staff lowered, then they would be defeated. Can you imagine being in Joshua's shoes in that moment, fighting for God? Fighting for your life to protect the people of God and seeing God's provision in the victory, watching your kinsmen around you be struck down at the lowering of a staff, the dependency that Joshua saw in that moment. Good lesson, a lesson that would be with him as he entered into the land to fight the other nations, to inhabit the land that God was giving them. God was preparing him. In Exodus 24, when Moses meets with the Lord on Mount Sinai, Joshua goes up with him. We don't know how far up the mountain Joshua went, but it says that Moses arose with Joshua and all the elders stayed down. That must have been quite an experience for Joshua. Numbers 11, Joshua is called the attendant of Moses from his youth. Numbers 14, Joshua, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the 12 spies and one of the two who actually wanted to enter the promised land at that time in Numbers 27, Moses asked for a successor and God answers him with Joshua. We see it again in Deuteronomy 31 where Moses publicly proclaims that Joshua will succeed him. All of this was God's plan. All of this was taking place because of God's divine will, because of his sovereign plan for his people. And while nothing fully prepares you for a moment like this, Joshua is called to embrace what God has commissioned him to do and to step out in faith. And this is really an awesome example of, of watching God's sovereignty working simultaneously through man's responsibility. God is giving them this land. He has set a plan in motion. He is executing this plan. And he calls Joshua. He gives him a command to cross this river Jordan, to cross into the land, to step out in faith. God was preparing him all along for this moment. And this is how God works, is it not? As long as we have breath, believer, we can be assured that God is preparing his people for something that will result in his good or his glory and their good. What is God preparing you for at this moment? Believer, what is God preparing you for? Maybe it's ministry. Maybe it's global missions. I'm sure the challenges that Joshua faced wandering in the desert seemed hard. They seemed perilous. God was using it to prepare him for this moment. Maybe God is preparing you to lead a Bible study. Maybe God is preparing you to be a light in your workplace. Mothers, what is God preparing you for? Might God be preparing you to raise the next Daniel? What are you doing with your heart today so that when God places something scary... 
When God places something intimidating in front of you, you are prepared to step out in faith and to trust in him. So the first distinctive we see of God's commission to Joshua was God's plan. This event, this time was set in motion long ago. They're, the people of God are about to step into the promised land. The second distinctive of God's commission of Joshua we see is God's provision. God's provision. Number two, God's provision. Look at verses three and four with me. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I've given it to you. Just as I spoke to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. Here we see the divine provision of God for his people. Joshua is about to enter into the promised land and he's told by God that every place on which the sole of his foot treads, it will be given to them. And God gives an actual specific description of the land he has given him. Again, this only fortifies the fact that this was God's plan from the beginning. He has it mapped out exactly the land that he wants his people to dwell in. The wilderness was the southern boundary. Lebanon was the northern. The great river was the east. The great sea, the setting sun, was the west. And look at the verb tense in verse 3, God says, I have given it to you. It's the perfect tense. What that means is that the counsel of God has been formed long ago, and what is about to happen now is the execution of God's divine will. It, he has given it to them. It's as good as done. Those seven nations standing in your way, don't worry about them. I've given you this land. Just as, Moses, just as Moses had God going before him, Joshua has God going before him. And he's telling, God is telling Joshua, this will happen. I will provide it for you. Trust in me. Hope in me. And what kind of God is this? The made-up gods of pagans don't begin to compare with this God. No other God is like this God. No other God cares for his people this way. No other God provides for his people this way. How can you not be driven to worship when you see the unmerited care and provision of this God for his people? Joshua felt this provision as he led God's people into the promised land. Let me ask you this. Do you feel God's provision in his son? God is faithful. He provides for his people. He, was gonna, he did provide for Joshua. And for everyone who will repent of their sins and believe upon him, he has provided salvation. He has provided a way to be reconciled to him. Do you feel God's provision in his son? God says, I've given you all things pertaining to life and godliness. Do you feel that provision on a daily basis? When you're stressed out with work, do you feel the provision of God? When you're battling a specific sin, do you feel the provision of God? When tragedy strikes, do you feel the nearness, provision, and care of God? So first, we've seen the plan of God. We just looked at the provision of God, God's provision. And now number three, the third distinctive of God's commission of Joshua is God's promise. God's promise. This is, this is awesome. You have to see this. Look at verse five. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life promise. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. Promise. I will not fail you 
or forsake you. Promise. Never in the history of time has a military leader received a more sure promise than what Joshua receives here. Napoleon never received a promise like this. Alexander the Great, he never received a promise like this. God calls Joshua to cross the river, cross the river Jordan, and if that wasn't a challenge enough with all the people, once across, they're going to face seven nations who are going to oppose them, who are going to want to protect what they think is their land, and they are going to want to destroy Israel. And Joshua is not inheriting an army only. He's leading women and children as well as ones who are prone to grumbling. He's leading an army, but he's leading women and children as well. He's leading a whole nation. And at that, they're prone to grumbling and discontentment. I can imagine Joshua taking a look and going, oh wait, what? What people? These people? These are who you wanted me to take into the promised land? These are who you want me to lead? This is a large task. And God is here at the bank of the Jordan telling Joshua, I, Yahweh, I was with Moses. I was with him during the plagues in Egypt. I was with him when I parted the Red Sea. I was with Moses in the wilderness when you needed food. And listen, Joshua, I am with you now. And this is not a conditional promise here. Listen, Joshua will not succeed and obey. He will not succeed because he obeys God's instruction. He will succeed because God is with him, enabling him to obey his instruction. God will not be with him because he obeys. Rather, God God will be with Joshua. Joshua will obey because God is with him. This is part of God's plan. Before Joshua is God's provision for his people. And here God promises Joshua that he will be with him. What an awesome promise. Can you ever... Can, can you imagine God ever failing you? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine God ever forsaking you? Sometimes it feels as though he may, doesn't it? Sometimes a, a very tragic, significant, hard, painful, disturbing life-altering event happens in your life. The feeling of God leaving or forsaking you doesn't lie in God's character. It lies in your character. God will not leave you. God will not forsake you. The promise that he makes to Joshua here, he has promised to his church. Matthew 28, he says, go make disciples. And at the end of it, he says, and lo, I am with you always. Think about it. Think about this. Wrap your mind around this. Jesus is with you until he comes back. That's what he says. Jesus is with you until he comes back. Wrap your mind around that promise. Do you live in such a way that you demonstrate a belief in that promise? What does that promise produce in a person when believed? Let's keep going. The first distinctive of God's commission of Joshua is God's plan. Number two, God's provision. Number three, God's promise. And now in verse six, we see God's prerequisite. Number, number, I'm sorry, in verse six. Number four, God's prerequisite. Look at verse six. Be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. In verse 2, we see the command to cross the Jordan. And now in verse 6, we see the command to be strong and to be courageous. What is God's prerequisite for Joshua? It's right there. Joshua, be strong and be courageous. I've told you my plan I've told you my provision, I've told you and given you a promise, and now be strong and be courageous. 
And we actually see the promise God made in verse 5 reinforced in the second half of verse 6. God tells Joshua, I will be with you. Be strong and courageous. I will be with you. The call to be strong and courageous is sandwiched between the promise that God will be with him. Look, there's an inherent weakness in all of us. There is the fear of the unknown. Fear of defeat. Fear of failing. And God is telling Joshua to not fear, but to stand firm. He's exhorting Joshua to not fear, but to be fearless. Listen, Joshua expected this day. He was informed of it. He was prepared for it. But here he is. The servant of the Lord is dead. The raging river lies between him and the land that he was to inherit. And in this land are numerous nations that want to destroy him. But listen, Moses the great may die, but God's promise lives on. It's the passing of an era, but not the ending of a promise. And because of the assurance that Yahweh is with him always, Joshua can be strong And Joshua can be courageous. Let's think for a moment what God did not say. Let's think for a moment what doesn't surround this call to be strong and to be courageous. God doesn't tell Joshua to look within himself. God doesn't tell Joshua to be confident, to speak positive words. God calls Joshua to remember his promise, to remember his character, to remember the God that Joshua is serving, to remember the nature of God, to remember the compassion of God for his people, to remember the provision that God has provided in the past as he led Moses, and to remember the provision of God that he is telling him they will receive. Joshua is told by God, I swore to Israel's fathers to give them this land as if God's very word isn't enough. He swore it. God, Yahweh, the creator of heavens and earth, he swore to their fathers, I will give you this land. God's character, God's person, God's holiness is at stake in this promise. That is where you get your strength. That is where you get your courage. Joshua. And we see that Joshua cannot move forward in the will of God, timid and afraid. And Christian, neither can you. Neither can you. In 2 Timothy 1, Paul tells Timothy that God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but power, love, and discipline. Christian, are you timid? Are you fearful? If so, you can be assured that it is not from God. Hebrews 13 says, For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Being saved by Christ, having a relationship with Christ, knowing God intimately produces that response. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? And the answer, obviously, is no one. It's nothing. And it's interesting, as we observe these distinctives of God's commission of Joshua, we see many of them intertwining with one another. Reiterated, we've seen that God being with Joshua, we've seen God being with Joshua, and we're going to see that with the necessity of Joshua to be strong and courageous. The only hope he has of being strong and courageous is that God is with him. What we see next, however, I believe is is shocking in light of what is taking place here. The next couple verses hold truths that I think are, are 
almost overwhelming when we think about what is taking place. In God's commission of Joshua, we saw God's plan first. Next, we see God's provision. Then we see God's promise. We just looked at God's prerequisite. And now, number five, we see God's precept. We see God's precept. Look at verses seven and eight. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Again, God calls Joshua to be strong and courageous. Only this time he adds the intensifier, be strong and be very courageous. And then he points Joshua to the law. God commands Joshua to obey the word of God. I said this verse is shocking, and let me show you why. What is taking place right here? What's going on in this verse? Joshua is talking to God. God is actually speaking to Joshua. Divine revelation is taking place right here. Direct revelation. Joshua is being commissioned by God and is receiving direct revelation from God. And you know what God tells him? You know what God tells him? Look at my word. Look at my word that I've written. Look at my law. Look at what I have given you. Look at what I have spoken. He doesn't tell him, hey, stay close. These chats, we should have these more often. That'll make sure that you're successful in the land. He doesn't say, look for a mystical experience. He doesn't say, hey, watch out for a sign. God's done that in the past. He was a pillar of smoke before them, fire at night. And that's not what he tells Joshua here. He tells Joshua, look at my word and do it. Obey my word. Meditate on it and obey my word. It's shocking. Jesus is being commissioned by God and God tells him the key to success in this commission is to obey scripture. God says do not turn to the left and do not turn to the right from the word of God. Do not go outside of what I have given you. Do not look to a mystical experience for success in this. Joshua 1 demonstrates to Joshua and Psalm 1 echoes this truth to all who will follow Christ and says, blessed is the man who does not, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. Blessed is the one who, who has the word of God on his lips, on her lips. The truth of God is crucial. It's crucial for every believer. A life that is pleasing to God, a life that is filled with biblical success does not come from mystical experiences. It doesn't come from emotional highs. It doesn't come from warm feelings. It doesn't come from new, from new gimmicks. It comes from a life that knows and is obedient to the word of God. And what is the best way to be obedient to the word of God? Don't let it depart from your mouth. Do not let the word of God depart from your mouth. When you face joys and successes, what should come from our mouth? When you face trials and temptation, what should come from our mouth? When we are found in sin, what should come from our mouth? When we need to care for a brother or sister in sin, what should proceed from our mouth? 
The Word of God. The Word of God. God tells Joshua to meditate on it. We see this also in Psalm 1, as I mentioned earlier. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the path of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law, in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Day and night. The word meditate here is literally mutter. It's it's muttering the word of God day and night. It's on your mind. You're speaking it quietly to yourself. You're thinking on it. The idea is that it it is on your mind. It is on your heart. When you're trying to memorize something, you're going, okay, I've got to remember this and this. That's what God's word should be for us. That's what God's word needed to be for Joshua. And let me ask you this. Joshua has just been given leadership over Israel. He's just been given leadership over Israel. They're about to cross the Jordan and they will experience constant opposition. He's leading an army and he's leading a nation. They're crossing a river. They're going to be in constant warfare as they enter this land. Do you think Joshua was a busy man? Do you think Joshua had a lot on his plate? Do you think it was a busy season of life for him? He was to spend much time in the word of God. Much time in the word of God. This one who has been with Moses in the wilderness 40 years. This one who is receiving divine revelation from God. This one who is going to have Yahweh go before him into the land is to spend much time Time in the Word of God. God tells him, My word must be in your mouth constantly. What priority does God's word have in your life? We see the priority it is to have in Joshua's life. It was in God's word that Joshua would receive direction, motivation, instruction, comfort, exhortation. All of these are found in God's word. Where do you find these things? Where do you look for these things? This was true for Joshua and it's true for the believer today. If you desire spiritual success, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment, what spiritual success is, but if you want a life of joy in the Lord, if you want a life of holiness, fill your heart and your mind with the word of God and obey it. Spurgeon said that Bibles that are falling apart usually belong to people who are not. Isn't that true? The importance of God's word in the believer's life, it cannot be overstated. And listen, here in verse 7 and 8, it starts with obedience to God's word and it ends with obedience to God's word. And James echoes this idea, calling believers to not only be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. Here Joshua must remember that in this call to be strong and to be courageous and to be obedient to God's word, it all stands on one foundation, and that's the promise of Yahweh. Believer, what promises has God made to you? How are you doing at renewing your mind with those promises? God tells Joshua to obey his word and God will make Joshua's way prosperous and that he will have success. First of all, anyone that attempts to make this passage into a promise of financial reward and earthly advancement for the one that will obey God is gravely mistaken. Gravely mistaken. That's not what this is talking about at all. They missed the point. You cannot make this passage divine success in the Lord in that way. God has revealed his will to Joshua. Success here is Joshua knowing and doing the will of God. That is success. 
God did not tell everyone, cross the Jordan, enter into the promised land, and you will be prosperous. God has said, my will for my people at this time is to cross the Jordan and enter into the promised land. And if you know this, and if you act upon it and are obedient and submissive to me, then you will be successful. You will be aligned with my will. If you listen to what I say and you do what I say, you will be aligned with my will. And that is biblical success. Leave the results to God. He's already ordained them. Biblical success is being what God wants you to be. It's doing what God wants you to do. It's having heaven's applause and not man's applause. It's being faithful to the work and not famous for the work. It is receiving a crown and not correction at the end. For Joshua's success and being prosperous did not alter God's will but align Joshua with God's will. What is God's will for you, believer? What is God's will for you? What are you doing to actively align yourself with God's will for you? The clearest expression of God's will for you, believer, is found here. This is where you will find God's will. Know it. Meditate on it. Speak it. And you will find yourself experiencing success as you are aligned with the will of God. In God's commission of Joshua, we've seen God's plan, we've seen God's provision, we've seen God's promise, we've looked at God's prerequisite, we just saw God's precept, and lastly, we see God's power. We see God's power. Verse 9 really acts as a recap of what God is calling Joshua to do. But it starts with a negative rhetorical, which it demands a response from the heart of the hearer. Look at verse 9. Negative rhetorical. What do I mean by that? It's right there. Have I not commanded you? Have I not commanded you? And it demands a response. Yes. Oh, yes. I heard it. You said it several times. Yes. And God says, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. As if everything God has said to Joshua isn't enough, a third time he commands Joshua emphatically, be strong and be courageous. Do not tremble. Do not be dismayed. I am with you. And God unequivocally states that he will be with Joshua. And we see that battles are not won by the quantity of warriors or the quality of weaponry or the amount of chariots and horses. They are not won by human strength, but battles are won by divine power. What battle are you fighting? Let me ask you this. What sin are you fighting? And what power are you looking to in that battle? Be strong. Be courageous. God is saying, I'm all powerful. I'm omnipotent. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear. Why? Because the great I am is going before you. If God is with you, who can be against you? Sound familiar? Are you fearful? God called Joshua to not be fearful, to cross the Jordan and enter the land. He says, I will be with you. We have the privilege of knowing what happens in the rest of the book. What happens just a few chapters later? They march around a fortress. They march around a giant wall. And God brings the wall down. God did it. God went before them. Just a little bit later, they're fighting a battle, and the sun stands still. God preserved the daylight so that they could complete the battle and win. God was before them. God 
made provision for their victory. Joshua saw this. And now for us, this side of the cross, what hope, what comfort, what joy, what peace comes from knowing the provision that God has made in his son for everyone who will repent of their sins and believe on him. What an awesome provider we have. There is no power like the power that we see in our God. And all of these acts combined, leading the people out of Egypt, providing for them for 40 years in the desert, crossing the Jordan, inhabiting the land, all of these expressions of God's power doesn't even begin to touch what he is capable of. God spoke and worlds began. For the sinner who is dead in their trespasses, who is an enemy of God, who wants nothing to do with God, dead in their transgressions and sins, only the power of God can make that one alive. And that is a great power of God. Are you fearful? Are there things in your life right now other than God that cause you to tremble? What does that say about how you view the power of God? This is important. I I want you to see this. Turn to Revelation 21. Turn to Revelation chapter 21, last book of the Bible. Almost the very end. Revelation chapter 21, we see a picture of the new heaven and the new earth. And in verse 7, the one who sits on the throne says... Verse 7, he who overcomes will inherit these things, the new heaven and the earth. And I will be his God and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What is the first description of? of the one cast into the lake of fire. The cowardly. The cowardly. I tell you what, I saw this seven, several, several years ago in my Bible reading, and now whenever I need to have a hard conversation, whenever there's a difficult task before me, whenever I find myself fearing something other than God, whenever I find myself cowering in the moment, I think of this verse. I'm thankful. I can't get it out of my mind. I'm thankful for that. I want no part of being a coward. And yet, any hope of not being a coward is only found in a right understanding of the character of God and the power of God. Of God. Believer, the power of God is greater than anything else. If God is for us, whom shall we fear? The power of God causes weak people to do things for God that puts on display the work that only God can accomplish. Only God could receive glory when Abraham had a son in his old age. Only God could receive the glory when Joseph ended up in Egypt despite his brother's sin. Only God could free Israel from Egypt. Only God could preserve two million people in a wilderness for 40 years. Only God could give these people victory as they entered the promised land. And listen, only God can redeem you from your sins. Only God holds this power. If you do not believe in this powerful God, if you've not repented of your sin and placed your trust in Jesus, you have to understand this. Have to understand this. Only God could save Israel from the surrounding nations. 40 years later when the spies enter into the promised land, they come back and they say, we're grasshoppers among giants. They'll destroy us. They were cowards.
Israel's greatest enemy as they'd entered into the promised land that they saw was the surrounding nations. But let me tell you this, if you do not believe in Jesus, your greatest enemy is not around you. It is within you. It is you. And only God can save you. Only God can reconcile you to himself. Your good works won't save you. Your so-called enlightenment will not save you. Your denial will not save you. Only the blood of Jesus Christ, only his perfect work will save you. Jesus, God descended from heaven. Jesus was born, lived a perfect life, a holy life, a life that none of us, not one of us, could ever live. Jesus did that. And then he went to a cross. He was nailed to that cross And he took on himself, the perfect holy one took on himself. He who knew no sin took on himself sin for all who believe so that those who will believe in Jesus might become the righteousness of God in him. If you do not know Jesus as your savior, repent and believe. The success that this world has to offer is fleeting. It perishes. What God has to offer to you, what God is offering to you right now in his son is eternal and it is wonderful. It is satisfying. And I would plead with you, repent. Repent, turn from your sins. Confess before the Lord that you need him Believe upon Jesus and follow him. He is a good God. Joshua had a divine commission from God. And in these first nine verses, we see a lot more about the greatness of God than the significance of Joshua. Joshua was an instrument for Yahweh. He was a good one at that. But his commission of Joshua put on display the goodness, kindness, provision, sovereignty, power, expectation of our sovereign and holy God. This is a good God. This is a good God. He provides for his people, and we see that here. Believer, he has provided for you in his son. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for revealing yourself to us so clearly. God, thank you for being such a good provider. Thank you for being so faithful. Each one of us on a, on a weekly, if not daily basis, receive and give empty promises and speak and receive empty words. No word from you is empty. No promise that you have made is questionable. You are faithful. You are just. You are good. You care for your people. Lord, you gave a bold commission to Joshua. Lord, you have given us a bold commission who believe in you. Lord, let us, like Joshua, be strong and be courageous. Let us, like Joshua, bring our hearts constantly to your word. Let it be on our lips. Let it be in our minds. 
Lord, let us have a right view of success. Lord, help us to be useful servants, Lord. If you are for us, whom shall we fear? You are our mighty fortress. You are our faithful God. Help us, like Joshua had to place his trust and place his hope in you. Lord, I pray that this moment we would place our trust in you. I pray that as we go about our week, I pray that when we face difficult circumstances in our jobs, school, home, relationships, whatever it may be, I pray that we would place our trust and our hope in you. You are trustworthy. You never fail. You will not leave us. You will not forsake us. Amen.